As always, this episode is sponsored by my go-to everything for makeup, Revlon. Hey everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today we are talking to the always uplifting Cleo Wade. Cleo is an artist, poet, and best-selling author whose work has changed lives all over the world. In this episode, we talk about self-love, boundaries, harnessing our power, and so much more. First of all, thank you for coming on Pretty Big thank Deal. You. I Thanks know like these are the last months where we're just like cramming work so in just like so that we can take a little time off for when our little When are people you like come. officially gonna stop traveling and stuff? This is my last trip to Good. LA. This is my last like flight. Because the flights have gotten brutal. No, the Monday is my like last day. Cut yeah. off. Done. I did that I did that November first. I was like, I'm yeah. not getting on another airplane. Are you working up until you're popping? I'm working up until but you know, because I, I like I call myself like a stay at home writer right now. Right. Because it's like I when I'm not on the road touring or doing community building stuff, it's like I can still just get so much done without ever having to get out of my pajamas. Mm -hmm. And so that's like kind of the heaven I'm trying to live in right now. I just like swim, I walk in my garden. I've like turned into like wow. Oprah. Like I'm just like I like get excited about an eggplant growing <laughs> and like I just stay home. You are so LA. I know. <laughs> I know. I was like saying to Simon, I was like, should we like think about like getting a house in Santa Barbara? And he was like, are you okay? He's like, he's like, he's like, you act like you're like actually going through menopause, not having a baby. <laughs> and I was like, okay. We do right. have these like emotional roller coasters. Oh my gosh. Has your pregnancy been easy? I think I'm just entering the phase where I could cry at the, like anything Drop could make me pen. cry. Yeah. Like we were running a little late to my doctor's appointment yesterday and we took Simon's like really sporty car that's like jerky. And I was like, this car makes me want to throw up. <sighs> and then I'm like holding back the tears. And I was like, what? <laughs> like you actually feel like a crazy person. It, yeah. it is pretty crazy. I think that I'm at the point where I'm like, you know what? I'm big and I'm just going to talk about it. And I just feel like every room I walk into, I'm like, <sighs> like I'm starting to like get like you, claustrophobic in my throat. Yeah. And I'm like, <gasps> like no, I have like the chest pain when you sleep, like, you can only sleep on one side or the other, but then I literally feel like this just like pressure in my chest. Is all your night. baby kicking a lot? Oh, all the time. All the right? time. It's so it's awesome. I know. You said that having a child is the ultimate act of optimism. Yeah. And I want to talk about that and and um and what it meant to you when you said that. When we decide to do this, right? Because we're so lucky to live in a time where we do have so much agency over our reproductive yeah. choices. And so it really is a choice and, and that is such a privilege and a blessing. And so if you are going to choose to have a child, then you're also choosing to say that you're up for the work it takes in our world for our child to be able to grow up in a world that is a healthy environment for mm -hmm. them and in a healthy environment for all of the other children in the world because they're all interconnected because it's one generation. And right. so I wrote the entirety of Where to Begin, my book from this year, during my first trimester. Because she has two books. I do. <laughs> um, I wrote it all during my first trimester and wow. I was- and it Wait, was you so wrote a book and, and, and published a book all within the last seven six, months? Six months. Six? So yeah, seven months. It was crazy because basically I went to, when I went to New York in April, before I got pregnant, in the beginning of the year, I wrote a kid's book. Mm -hmm. And when I went to New York in April to sell it, you know how it is with yeah. books, like you have it's your idea, you sell your idea, you take all these meetings. So I went to sell that book and I just had like a meet and greet with like, you know, I, not even, I had like a touch base with my adult publisher yeah. who I made hard talk not with. Not a sip and, and see. Yeah, not a sip and see, but honestly, Feels wish. Like it. Yeah. And so I went to meet with them and we were talking about, they were like, well, what's the next adult book you want to make? And I was like, well, I really want to talk about this time we're living in because when I go on tour or I talk to women everywhere I go, the, at the end of every sentence, they say, 
feedback. If they're like, how are you dealing with anxiety? Or how do you deal with body image? Mm -hmm. Or how do you deal with this? They always end the sentence with, especially during these times. Mm. And I heard it so much that I was like, well, what are we speaking to, especially during these times? That's why I wanted to write Where to Begin, which was is a book about how to feel capable of participating in our world, especially during these times. Mm. And they were like, okay, that's such a great idea, but like these times are happening right now. Mm -hmm. So they're like, are you gonna write this book? And like, like that just didn't occur to me at all. And so I was gonna write it and maybe have it come out next year, but I wasn't sure about that timing either because I didn't want it to get like completely politicized by the 2020 election. Oh, yeah. And so I was like, okay, well maybe we'll try for the very end of the year to get the book out. And then I got knocked up Same as here, we honey. do. Jeez Louise. And you, were surprised? We had decided that we wanted to, but we just didn't think it would, I told you this, so we fast. didn't think it would, the reason we even decided to start trying was because we'd had so many friends tell us that it took them a year. It took them like, oh, by the way, like this starting to try is just the beginning of the journey, fertility journey. Right. Like, Which it does happen it, for people. Sometimes so it's many. 10 years and then all of a sudden. And I think that actually for so many of my friends, it was at least a year or a year and a half like mm -hmm. and not with some people who you know didn't even go an IVF route or anything yeah. like that and right. so I was like oh yeah so we'll start trying I literally think I got pregnant the first time we had sex <laughs> <laughs> Fertile I was like, literally I was like oh <laughs> my god and so I was like okay great so we're now having a baby and I have to write a book I and so I was like I don't I would never want to put a book out that I couldn't tour because, you know, it's yes. so fun to be in community with the people that yes. you get to talk to and do your it's work important. for, you know, like so much of what we do, we do for ourselves mm -hmm. and our own journey. But it's also we, it's so such a blessing that we get to be either an example for other people or be it something that other people get to hold sacred in mm -hmm. their lives. And so you want to be able to see them, meet them and be with them. I basically was like, OK, I can if I can write this book in about two and a half or three months, I can get it to the printer right on time. I could tour it in October and then I could stop traveling in November. Wow. And, and then so, boom, here it is. And then here it is. And you're a true example of your words have power. I mean, mm. you've been so brilliant with how you've expressed yourself. I mean, you are the ultimate poet, especially oh of these times. <laughs> how has writing helped you move through life? You know, I always tell everyone, I'm like, even if you don't consider yourself a writer or you don't consider yourself. I don't, but I be, try to journal every day. But, you know, or Is whenever enough? you feel it, you uh -huh. know, I think that anytime we try to put anything on ourselves or like every day or every morning, whether that's meditation or writing mm -hmm. or anything, the first way that we can cultivate tools that actually can benefit our lives is to put them in our lives in ways that we can actually use them. So I think that whether you're a writer or not, if you're feeling something, writing is the best way to move it out of your body, mm. put it in front of you so you can see exactly what story you're telling and then decide if that is the story you want to keep telling. You just brought up something very important because the story we tell ourselves is what everybody is talking about right yeah. now. It's something that is like, it's buzzing around. Brene Brown talks about it. People are saying like, oh, my therapist said this to me. Yeah. And you had an aha moment with the stories that you were telling yourself. Yeah, you know, we but we sit here and we forget how much control we have of our narrative because we're not sure what the narrative is. Mm. When it stays trapped in our bodies or trapped in our minds, like on one day you're like, I think I feel this way, but you probably shouldn't feel this way because da da da. And you, there's mm -hmm. so many voices and so much conflict and you're br constantly bribing yourself to accept one situation versus another. And then anxiety comes in and then your thoughts are completely off path. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when you can just move it and say like, this is just for me and I just want to see what's going on in here. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you can then just decide, you know, what's real and what's true, right? Because I could wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm just like, why am I even writing this book? I'm not good enough. And that thought is real, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's really occurring. It's actually popping up in my head. But is that true? No. And you have to fight for what is true versus what comes up and is, is, is just real. What is true and what is real? It's like you want to tell yourself what you think is true, but then reality kicks in. And yeah. it could be the truth or but it could be... also reality is who, right? Reality uh, is the billboards we've seen growing up. Reality is the thing your teacher right. said to you when you were 
in third grade that stuck with you. Reality is how our parents raised us with maybe not the best habits for how we talk to ourselves or how we move through the world or how we feel about ourselves. And so those things might are all real. So when the thought comes, it's real. But is it true? Is that your truth? Is that your power? And that's kind of what led you into the fashion industry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I went to poetry summer camp when I was really young, but I felt like, you know, I, when you're a kid, I think especially as a girl, because your so society really allows you to be this way, but I really feel like if you're just deeply expressive, the first or most n like normative place you're allowed to be expressive is through clothes, right? Mm -hmm. So you can just be like, I'm gonna wear this with this, or like, I'm gonna, you know, think about being a teenager and like understanding sexuality even for the first time and being like, oh, so like, I'm gonna wear something that's shorter or long or, oh, right. or, or whatever. Whatever it is for you. It is, and then I think that mix is probably like growing up watching Sex in the City or something, you know? is then you're like, okay, I think you just moved to New York and just try to work in fashion. And then boom, you're in fashion, but then yeah. you're like, wait, this is a story that yeah. other people were telling me to do. Yeah. And it's like your your world's kind of got altered. Well, yeah, because people say, you know, you're good at that, you should do that. Or uh, something I always talk about is, you know, we have girlhood dreams, then we have womanhood dreams. Mm. And our womanhood dreams really have this power to deeply interrupt your girlhood dreams. So whenever you're feeling that knocking at the door that's like, I think there's something more here, or I'm feeling maybe a moral obligation to the world in a different way, or I feel like my life is about something a little bit bigger than me, that's your womanhood dreams coming in to say, okay, I think you've had enough time being able to be in the space of your girlhood dreams and kind of try to fulfill all the goals you probably set for yourself or ideas you, you cultivated at what, eight years old, mm -hmm. 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Are we really supposed to stay in the space of what those goals were for the rest of our lives? That's good. And I think that's why we have like what people call like a quarter life crisis a lot. You know, when you're all of a sudden like you're 25 or you're 23 and you're just like, wait, can I, is this how I want to do this? Like, am I happy? Like, do I want to do this kind of work? And I think it's actually because you're a woman, that's kind of when you start to hear that voice in the back of your head, that's your womanhood dream. Hold that thought. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit delivering amazing recipes right to your front door. Plus you can easily change your food and delivery options or skip a week whenever you need. There's all kinds of fun stuff in here. All of the ingredients are pre-portioned, so there's a lot less prep work for meals and they're quick to make. I mean, honestly, it's only gonna take you 30 minutes to do all of this. And HelloFresh is now $5.66 per serving. So go to hellofresh.com slash prettybigdeal10 and use the code prettybigdeal10 during HelloFresh's sale right now for 10 free meals, including shipping. What? Happy cooking. All right, now let's get back to this great conversation. So in having your womanhood dream, you know, you have your childhood dream and then you you kind of graduated into your womanhood dream. What was that transition like for you? You grew up in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Did it happen there or did it happen when you moved out? No, it was when I was here and I think it was probably when I was like 23-ish. And I think that I just started feeling like- Cause I... she's only 31. This <sighs> chick is so young and so deep, I can't. We're both 30. Well, you're I'm 30. 32. When did you turn 32? I just turned 32 last oh, yeah, week. Last week. Yeah. Back to your your womanhood Childhood. dreams. <laughs> you said um, they happened when you were 23. Yeah, I think around 23 is when I started feeling like I had something to say, or I also started to just notice that I was like, I'm just not okay with these things, or I didn't feel powerful, mm. but I there was some part of me that knew that. I deserve to feel powerful mm. in my own life. And so I would say that that was, you know, around the time where I just started doing much more spiritual work, just even in the sense of reading different books or spending more time with myself. Or if I wanted to paint, which I'm not a particularly great painter, but if I wanted to paint, I would paint. If I wanted to write something, I would write something. And I didn't judge whatever I wrote. And everything I wrote during that time is just like so bizarrely emo. But it was such a deep, therapy time for me. Mm -hmm. And in that, it was so interesting because I realized that once I just started doing the spiritual work, which was like, what do you feel like you're worth? And what do you feel like you deserve? And what does like every single person's life, you know, how valuable is every single person's mm. life and journey? And when I started to kind of work on 
you know, practicing self-care and practicing self-love, that's when I was like, you know what? And I'm actually not okay with like who we're electing to office. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'm actually like, I'm going to start being like, I'm the, the craziest recycler and composter. And I was like, and I want to know exactly how things are going to be, you know, made in my house. All of a sudden, everything started connecting to me, which was that every decision I made was important mm. and, and had to do with how our planet would survive and how the people who lived around me in my neighborhood would be able to have opportunity. And I really started to understand just how important it was to pay attention and get involved in the injustices that were around me. It was really like a space where I left also the kind of probably ignorance of childhood and girlhood. And it was like, you know what, to be a woman is to understand just how powerful you are. Mm. And also what a responsibility you have to use that power to help other people find theirs. That's a big moment to just have that realization. That really is. And then you kind of started incorporating art into it. Yeah. And now you've got a community. Yes, you're inspiring young. You've got art. You're going out and you're changing the world just like, you know, even if you're just recycling at your own house, like you were saying. Yeah. But how do you feel like your art is also inspiring and organizing the communities around you right now? We're almost just each of us are looking for like one mission statement or like one simple sentence that is like, that's exactly what I feel. Like that was actually a quotable it. moment. Literally, yeah. you know, because <laughs> by the way, that quotable moment or whatever we want to call it takes all these things that are complex and jumbled inside of us and says, oh, it's just this, mm -hmm. you know, and you're like, oh, I can live by that. I can understand that, you know, whether it's just saying like, you know, your life is constantly in a state of design. That is a powerful sentence because when we sit there being like, should I be doing this? Should I not be doing this? Was it wrong to do this? Am I right. like being flaky if I don't want to have this dream anymore, but I want this one done? And it's like, you always have the power to redesign it. Right. So when you can say those handful of words to someone, it gives them a space to be like, oh, that's what this is. I can name the complex thing I'm feeling. Right. And so for me, what I work to do, which is why, you know, so much of my work is spent listening to other people rather than talking myself because I'm trying to understand what people are going through so that I can help name it with them. Mm -hmm. Because I do think that once we name it, especially if it's something that's a block for us, then we can conquer it. Mm. It's something that doesn't kind of drive us around or isn't leading us around our lives. We have the power to say, you know what, I'm in charge here. I know what you are and you're not going to be the driving my life. but. I also understand I might not be able to get you out of this car, mm -hmm. but I will just put you in the back seat. It's interesting you say your your job is about listening, but there's so much of your job that's about writing as well. What led you to this medium of poetry? You know, it was such a risk when I was thinking about it because, I mean, I always think about how critical my girlfriends were when I really was like, I think I could be like, poet because they were the only ones in my life that were like, yeah, you should do that. My parents are like, mm, you know, because you're like, how like, are you going to make money? Yeah, because even to like have moved to New York and made it right. And as you know, to making it New York just means you can happily pay your rent. Seriously. That is the thing. I pay my rent every month and it is not. And that, I can eat. And that is not a stress. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's filled with snacks. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And so even be able to do that coming where I came from, where even in my early 20s, I probably made more than my entire family put together. Mm. And the idea to do something as independent as moving to New York and wanting to build a career or build a job that no one in my you know home could really understand was already, that was such a feat. And so when I was then all of a sudden like, yeah, and then I have this stable space where I make money and can pay my rent and help out my parents if they need help. I now want to switch it all up for something where it didn't exist. And even today, it's not really a space. I mean, because do people consider you more of an artist or a poet? Or I mean, I think of you as a poet. Whenever anyone asks me what I do, I just say like, I work with words for a living. So Interesting. however, I put those words into a space, so whether I speak them or I put them on a billboard or in right. a house or on Instagram or in a book, um, you know, what I focus on every day are, are words and, and the power of words. But when I wanted to do that, I was like, there was no one doing it uh, at all. I mean, that was modern, you know? Right. And so I was like, how do we like decide to just like 
He's like, yeah, I think I want to do what like Maya Angelou did. You're like, okay. Like when has there been a Maya Angelou in the past 50 right. years or like, right. or any type of person who's been able to make a true defining living who wasn't of even that generation of like kind of coming up in the during the women's liberation movement in the right. 70s and right. so but I was like there's just something I was like I know that like what I'm saying could help people and so I think that because I was always connected to that one thought I was so much braver because sometimes it's, it's a little bit easier to be brave for mm. other people than for yourself. I'm glad you brought up bravery because there has to be bravery in peeling back layers of yourself. Yeah. And in peeling back layers of yourself, you're exposing so much of who you truly are or what society is really going through. How do you cope through that? Especially now with people just watching and criticizing and looking and... You know, there's one mantra I have that I live by. I put it in Heart Talk, which is, if you ever give someone the power to make you feel like you're on top of the world, you give them equal power to make you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And when I remember the day I wrote that, because I remember I was writing it around a time where I was starting to get, you know, like, you know that moment where people just really start to pay attention to your work and because you know you do your work for a lot longer than people yep. pay attention to your work and most people don't know that so when all of a sudden calling you the new thing or the da 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 and you're, you're like, like I'm old to me are trust. you serious yeah. I've been doing this for 15 years really yeah you know and so I remembered thinking I was like I have to just remember that I go to work every day mm. and that I go to work for the people I write for every day. Mm. And I was like, and I have to stay connected to that. So even if someone calls me the millennial Oprah or any type of praise or any type of insult, my answer is always the same, which is that I go to work every day for the people I write for. Mm -hmm. And that's my focus. And because I feel like I'm always focused on that, every bit of work I do is also for that. So even when I'm you know, in my own therapy and working on my own life to be more courageous or more vulnerable or more honest or all the things that we start to kind of work on in, in, in our own lives, I never do it so that I can handle scrutiny better publicly or praise better. I always do it so that I can be more authentic to connect with the people that I write for and the people around me in my life, my friends and family. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's the way more people should be handling just life, I think, and social media. It's like not about the scrutiny. It's not about the praise. It's about just, inspiration and going for to yourself. Work. Even. Yeah. yeah, that is truly living life on your own terms. Mm -hmm. Um, and any time you let the praise or the scrutiny get in the way, then you just you just took a deal and you're living life on other terms. Mm. And so I think that for me, I'm very, I stay in like a non-negotiable space, mm. which is that I, I know exactly why I go to work and I go to work every day. And even if it's like the nicest, most amazing compliment on the planet, I always just say thank you. And I put my head down and I go back to work. That is how I feel always connected to my mission and what's important to me and always connected to myself. Mm -hmm. Because by the way, the scrutiny and the praise are also narratives that can be really hard not to get caught up in. Very hard. Because the world starts to tell you you're this one thing and then you're living to be that one thing. And you know, I, I noticed too, cause you're not as, you don't put your relationship as much on line either. And that's a huge reason Simon and I talk about it is that we have some things we, share yep. and we share it at a time that's comfortable for us mm -hmm. and then we have some things we don't because we also it's really hard because people will take your relationship and put it in a place where you all of a sudden have something you're trying to live up to where they're just like oh they're so da 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 they're blah 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 they would never da da and you're like what you know we're in couples therapy just like the next couple or like you know sometimes and... it's like fun date night by the way yes <laughs> it's hot <laughs> but it's funny because like I feel I feel like everything you're saying is what people need to have more of because there's so much hurt. And I think that people have a hard time in this world right now with forgiveness. Yeah. And I am curious what your philosophy is on forgiveness because it's a deep rooted issue yeah. that I think a lot of people are going through. You know, it's interesting because we all have so many open wounds. Mm. Every single one of us don't care who you are. Hello and we either never healed them or they were never healed correctly. Mm -hmm. And the work of, of, of our life is to heal them correctly because as we, the old saying goes, hurt people hurt people, right? But heal people heal people. Mm. So 
if you can figure out what you even thought was healed, but is still manifesting some crazy shit in your life, then it was just never healed correctly, right? Right. And if you have something that is so raw, every time anything happens in your life, then the wound is still really open and we have to figure those things out. And I think forgiveness is a huge part of a lot of those wounds. I think self-forgiveness is one of the biggest issues I hear people struggle with. Biggest. I have two things about forgiveness that I always think about. One is that I remember um, I asked a friend of mine, my friend Nicole, a couple, like a year ago, I asked her how she practiced self-care. And she said, I practice self-care through self-forgiveness. Mm. She goes, because when I realized that if I could figure out how to forgive myself for who I was two years ago, five years ago, or five minutes ago, then I can even be in the headspace to understand what I need to take care of myself. Mm. Because that lack of self-forgiveness is such a block. And then there's this one other um, thing about forgiveness that I, I put in where to, I, I turned it into a poem in some way in where to begin. But last year, I interviewed Alice Walker, who's one of my favorite writers of all time. I asked her how she practiced self-forgiveness and how she practiced forgiveness and what her relationship was with forgiveness. She looked at me, she's so funny because she's like a Buddhist. And you know how Buddhists kind of like, they simplify life in such a way that they almost act like every question is stupid. So that she'll be like, <laughs> I was like, we well, you know, what rituals do you have for writing? And she goes, I don't know what you mean. And, and you're like, okay, but <laughs> the best thing she said to me was, I said, you know, how do you practice forgiveness? And she goes, forgiveness. I love my freedom way too much to stay shackled into non-forgiveness. Mm. And it was such a mind-blowing moment for me because I never associated freedom with forgiveness. Oh, really? It hadn't been that apparent to you big of an ex but it wasn't a, that big of an expression because you know forgiveness i'd heard of it being like trapped right or mm. i've heard forgiveness feel just uncomfortable or stuck right because there is so much free freedom forgiveness i think i think are completely parallel it's like you've literally put handcuffs on yourselves yeah. when you have not forgiven but you know i'd never because you know we all talk all day long about how important freedom is and how we value freedom. We don't and it it's forgiveness. so big and, and, and we don't realize that forgiveness is just as big as it mm -hmm. because it's big enough that it can block, block freedom. I always kind of looked at it as something I was like, oh, you know, it can kind of get in the way. Mm. But I never looked at it as like, I feel so lucky to be free and be a woman who has freedom or be a woman of color who gets to live in a space and a time and a country and a place where I am free mm. and I love my freedom. Mm. I love to have the freedom to dance and say what I wanna say and be who mm -hmm. I wanna be. Why would I ever compromise something I love that much for non-forgiveness? I think that my freedom and forgiveness came, it was interesting because I'd already been married a couple years, but I had to forgive my father for just his past behavior and growing up. My relationship with Justin accelerated after that. Wow. Because it was like I had this barrier of what a man was supposed to be, what a husband was supposed to be, how you were supposed mm. to act as a wife. Mm. And the moment I was like, I've really forgiven my father. Like this yeah. is this is a done deal for me and I love him and whatever the relationship is, it is. But it helped my marriage in a way that I didn't even know. Wow. Forgiveness is key. Yeah, it really is. And and I think that what's also fascinating is that, you know, we can forgive others mm. and then we still stay second not forgiving ourselves. And yeah, so I no, think if we can deal. get to the second part too, because I remember even just in when I have had bad relationships, I remember being like, it was so crazy how I could forgive the like psycho guy. Mm whether it was cheating on me or being mean to me or all the things that we put up with when we're 20. Girl. And and then I'd find myself on, walking on the street one day being like just all of a sudden really mad or like mm -hmm. really angry or really upset. And I was like, wow, I'm upset because I haven't, I am, can't forgive myself for taking that treatment. Yeah. One of my favorite definitions of uh, regret is, regret is just when you were paying too much attention to decisions you made while you were still learning. And I remember when I read that definition of regret and I was like, oh, forgiveness became so much easier for me, self-forgiveness did. Right. Because I was like, why? I was like, I was like not having self-forgiveness is just paying too much attention to decisions you made while you were still learning. 
So you have this unbelievable quote that I actually posted yesterday. I sent it to my mom. It really resonated with me and like everything I'm going through with my family. And it was boundaries don't mean I don't love you. They mean I'm going to love you and myself at the same time. Mm. And for me, that was like this, whoa, that's what I'm gonna tell everybody when they tell me that mm. I'm confrontational, yeah. that I like drama. I sent it to my mom too, because she's had to cut very close people in her life, in her family, out of her life yeah. in order to stay sane. Yeah. And I think that people put a label on you when you create boundaries for yourself. And those labels are ugly because you're actually doing a better service for yourself and yeah. putting up a boundary. And that was just like, I mean, my mind, I, sh I shared it with everybody on my team yesterday, so thank you. Well, I, I have to talk to you about your Are You OK booths yeah. because this is just such a brilliant idea. A couple of times a year, I set up a booth it's really cute. Have you seen the booth? It's yes, like, it's, it's got adorable. a red and white checkered. It looks like a and little- And it's your handwriting. Yes. It is inspired by the booth from Lucy and the Peanuts okay. when she had her like five cents for a psychiatrist, but I don't charge. And it has flowers and it says, are you okay? Free, peaceful and loving conversation. And I sit in a public park um, and I usually try to make sure it's a park in a neighborhood that has just like a variety of people. So for example, in New York, I would never do it in Central Park, right. but I'll find a park in like, on Fulton downtown. Right. So we're it's like, like Prospect Park. Come near, on over to Brooklyn. Yeah, okay. And so you're actually around such a mix of people. Uh, what are you hearing? What are people coming up and saying to you? You know, I've really- Because you sit there at the booth and people literally just come up to you yeah. and you ask the question, are you okay? And it's like a therapy session almost. It kind of is. And what's been really great about the last few times we've done it, you know, the last time I did it was in LA. And what we realized is that the line was so long and people were really making friends in the line, which we loved because one of the things we hear the most is how lonely people feel. Mm -hmm. And so this time what we did was we wrote everyone's name down for the line instead um, and we put picnic blankets all around the booth and we had people sit with strangers basically and so what was really cool about the last time we did the booth was it was basically like a friendship day and it was a place where people just came to meet new friends and they picnicked and they had lunch and they hung out and I think the people that signed up in the first hour I don't know if we ever got past them throughout the whole wow. day and, and is so, there a time limit for them to talk to you there's not but as you know, most people have an insecurity of taking up space, right? right? So the first thing they'll say is like, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Or, or like, oh, I'll be really quick, quick right? right? right. Um, or my favorite is that they'll sit in the booth and be like, I'll be like, how are, and I always say like, are you okay? Like, how are you doing? They're like, I'm great. And I was like, are you? And they're like, no. Like, <laughs> but it's so funny because we have this, you know, immediate inclination to lie, yeah, you know, to make course. another person feel comfortable. And I was actually just talking to a friend of mine about this in text on the way here. And I was like, she's uh, surviving breast cancer this year and it's, she's healthy and happy, but it's an emotional roller coaster. Mm. I was saying to her, I was like, you know, you don't have to keep saying you're okay mm. because you know in the ultimate way you are okay mm. um and it's on a lack of gratitude and i was like i really want you to try going on an honesty cleanse mm. and i said where you don't say a single word outside your personal truth wow and so i was like and you can be creative with the language so that you're not just sitting here being like i feel fucking horrible right, right. but you can say this year has been really challenging i'm grateful to have a lot of the tools that i have um but no matter what the scope is of surviving this, it's definitely something you survive and it's hard. And I was like, even if you could just do an honesty cleanse for a month, I was like, I guarantee you it'll change your life. I just think it's so inspiring for you just to say like, hey, are you okay? I think mm -hmm. more people should be asking others, it's even so strangers. It's so, it's so simple. simple. It's about giving, it's about talking, it's about community, Seeing people just- Seeing people for just a minute. Most <sighs> people are just looking for a place to be seen and heard. I think it's brilliant and I'm so glad you're doing it and thank you for doing it because I think more people need to just get things off their chest. Mm -hmm. Something that I'm curious if you're doing, are you doing your belly breathing? I mean, there's just things a bad pregnant woman, but I have like not I was just done about to... a thing. Me, like me. I haven't like, <laughs> I don't know any way to breathe, push this baby out. I haven't done the research or anything. I, I actually just got a crib and like a changing table yesterday because those had the longest, oh, they take forever yeah. to get to your house. And oh great, I haven't even ordered mine yet. Oh, I'll send you links. Thank you. Well, I bring up the importance of breathing because you have the, another incredible quote. When you inhale deeply, you are reminded that you are alive. Yeah. And I want to talk about how breath represents possibility. Yeah. But it's so real because I think I have some friends who don't breathe until 
the end of the day and they've yeah. just been keeping it in. And I have to remind myself to yeah. <sighs> sometimes. Well, and what is anxiety, by the way? Mm. Anxiety is when you are hijacked off of a normal breathing path, mm. right? And I think that with that is, is how we easily become hijacked off of a healthy thinking path. You know, I think our thoughts are really connected with our ability to breathe, right? Mm. You know, because the second you can't breathe is when we have panic, right? I can't breathe, something's wrong. And, and we're triggered into this space or all these things are going wrong and now I can't breathe and da, 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 and everything's getting worse because you can't breathe. And so I think that I always tell people, I was like the most valuable free ass self-care tip I have is to breathe. If there is one thing, because everyone will sell you self-care all day long. Yes, they will. And know how to go on a walk if you're upset. Mm. Know how to breathe when you need to breathe and drink water. Self-care does not have to cost a fortune. No. And the three most valuable things you can do for self-care are free. Drink water, breathe. And know when to just leave the room. And know when to leave the room. Those are really good takeaways from this conversation. Yeah. And thank you for being here. Thank you. For I don't want to stop talking to you, but you know these podcasts, you can only talk for like thirty or forty minutes. <laughs> I know. Then they're just kind of like, okay, no. like my morning commute's over. <laughs> I know. Well, everybody, that's all you get today. But we do one thing at the end of every pretty big deal. It's a little live boldly lightning round. Okay. I'm just going to ask you the question. You just have to answer okay, it. I'm ready. The last pretty penny I spent. The crib. The crib. So expensive. <laughs> It's so expensive. What's a deal, biggest deal breaker for you? Non-listeners. Mm. I think that if you are, I one of the things that if I've ever had to put boundaries where I've been like, mm, that's not someone I could be close friends with, it's because they're not, they don't really listen. That's a good one. And because you're a pretty big deal and you're on pretty big deal and I only like to talk to pretty big deals. What's <laughs> a pretty big deal to you? Top of mind, I'm guessing just our babies right now, right? You know, it's, yeah. it's, crazy. We're about to have big reality checks, girl. Yeah. I'm glad we're doing it together. Well, Cleo, wait, thank you so much for joining us on thank Pretty you Big so Deal. Much for You're so beautiful me. inside Love and you. out. Don't forget to join the conversation on social. Follow us, Pretty Big Deal on Instagram and Twitter, and send us all your questions and comments. We want to hear from you. 